to start. And this is, uh, they said, what do you want to do? Do you want to be interviewed? And I went, that will require me probably to get up in the morning early enough to meet the person who's going to be interviewing me. And mornings are not my time. So I said, give me whatever I can just do by myself without having to drag some other poor soul down with me. So what I'm doing, this is a Q and A. And those who have Qs will get very long A's because that's how I work. Uh, but I wanted to just say a couple of things first, since this is kind of my best of honor. Um, I was thinking, and what, what I was going to say is, I was actually thinking about this last night, and I was thinking about, you know, how the only time that like sort of mainstream news ever wants to talk about authors' backgrounds is either if they are, um, you know, from a rich and impressive family, or if they were dirt poor. You know, I guess it's like you grow up wealthy or something, you know, and you live in a cabin and you grew up, I don't know, eating sticks or something. And, <laughs> but this was not the case with me. So I was thinking about that. Is there a way to dramatize my otherwise utterly uninteresting, uh, but very nice uh, upbringing in a uh, suburb of, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area, Palo Alto, which is the Stanford University town. It was a lovely place to grow up. It was, it was not the, uh, the, uh, the beeping fire alarm at the center of Silicon Valley at that point. It was, it was a college town, and it was kind of a hippie liberal college town. And, you know, beautiful streets, lots of trees, all that stuff. But it makes a lousy story. I, I remember one German interviewer uh, tried, to, uh, tried to jazz it up a little bit, and he took something I said quite far out of context back like several miles out of context. When I saw the interview, it, it talked about how I grew up in the bad part of Palo Alto. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, of course, my family, my close friends just mercilessly drilled me on that one. It's like, it's like ooh, yeah, you poor guy, you poor guy. Uh, and uh, you actually had to lock your 10 speed at night, you know, things like that. Um, but anyway, but no, but as I was thinking about that, I realized, in fact, it, where we writers come from in a geographical sense is not a point, especially in our field. Because every writer I knew, we all grew up in a lot of the same places, and those were the books that we read. We grew up in Middle Earth. We grew up with Ratty and Mole messing about on the river. We grew up in Oz and Tralfamador and Hyperborea and Lovecraft's Innsmouth and you name it. Because that's really the thing that links us all together and it almost always happened to us in childhood somewhere that we fell in love with something. I fell in love with Ray Bradbury's upbringing in Illinois because I loved the stories and I would always think, yes, that's how a writer should grow up. <laughs> you know, not in a middle class suburb, but you know, out there in the fields and you know, able to run around with all your friends out in the middle of nowhere. So I, that's really it. I mean, the, I grew up in the same places as many of you, which are the, the worlds that I fell in love with, whether it was Bradbury's Illinois or Bradbury's Mars, whether it was Earthsea, or as I mentioned, Little Earth or Narnia, and that's my background. I'm a book person. Um, it's interesting because in some ways, of course, we are a, a different breed from the new generations, which does not mean they are not readers. It does not even mean that, that they are not readers who are as fully immersed in these worlds as I was, as most of us have been or were, but it means they are taking the reading part out of a very wide bandwidth of other kinds of information and other kinds of storytelling, including games and online stuff and social media. So I'm going to be very interested to see how the next generation turns out and how the book people become book people, because I believe book people throughout history, probably going back to Mesopotamia and ancient China and even earlier than that, um, are all book people because they fall in love with the written word and the one thing that the written word does better than anything else, which is that it provides 
the most interactive experience in, the, in, in, in storytelling that is possible. Because none of my books, for instance, since I'm talking about me, which I know is a big shock to my friends out there, but none of, none of my books are my books. They exist as books only when people read them. And when people read them, every single person is bringing something of their own to those books and doing several things in the stories better than I can do it because they are personalizing them. Last thing on this idea before we start taking questions. And one of the ways this struck home to me very, very strongly was um, many of you remember when the Lord of the Rings movies first started coming out. And like a lot of other people who had been big Tolkien fans growing up, there was a part of me that was afraid that somehow seeing the movies would, would you know, like, like with uh, computer memory, it would print over, you know, it would, it would cover up what I already had in terms of my interaction and reaction and the world that I had built in my mind in Middle Earth. So before the movies came, the first movie came out, I deliberately sat down for the first time in quite a few years. I mean, I used to read The Lord of the Rings like once a year when I was younger. But it had been probably 15 years at that point. I sat down and reread the entire trilogy to um, kind of reaffirm it in my mind. And as I was doing this, I had this revelation that although Tolkien, being Tolkien, being a lover of trees and things like that, was extremely specific in his descriptions of places and vegetation and all that kind of stuff. Me, at that point in my life, when I first read it, I was 11. I had never been out of California. So what I imprinted on the Tolkienian descriptions was the landscape of Northern California. It was the trees I knew, it was the hills I knew, the Barrow Downs were you know, parts of like Highway 152, you know, where, where there's big granite outcroppings coming out of the hills and stuff like that, which are not barrows, obviously, because nobody's buried them. But to me, that was what I saw in my mind's eye, because that's what I knew. But as I was reading the book, and I was reading and told me it's very specific description of beech trees or ash or alder or whatever, and what I was seeing in my head was scrub oak and spruce and redwoods, because that's what I had experienced at that age of my life. That was wilderness for me. So it was a really interesting kind of a reaffirmation of that tr truth, which is a great truth for me, which is that I do not, my books don't exist as pristine objects. They are the possession of anybody who is kind enough to read them. I almost said buy them, but that's, that's crass. They are the possession of anybody who is kind enough to read them. And they expand the world. So it's an amazing feeling to realize that. If everybody that has ever read an author's book is participating with that author, is building the world with that author, and they have made that world that is limited by usually black letters on white pages, they have made it into a bigger place all by themselves. And you multiply that by however many books you are lucky enough to be however many readers you are lucky enough to have, and there you are. Um, you are multitudes, and the stories become multitudes. So thank you all for that. It's a, it's a wonderful situation to be in, and I'm very pleased. Now, we come to the portion where the interaction becomes harder for you, because you cannot be passive and just read the books and interact. Now I need two people to answer, ask questions that I can answer. Um, there are no bad questions, and I don't have to talk just about my work. I'm happy to talk about anything, and I mean anything. So, anybody have a question? First, this back here, this lady here, and then you, okay? Great big, expansive, deep, complicated world. How do you keep track of the details without getting lost or overwhelmed? That has only recently become a two part answer. <laughs> the original answer was, it's all in here. That was true for a very, very long time. Um, there were virtually no notes, and there's a reason for that. It's because for me, when I'm working with very complicated plots and many different locations and all these and lots and lots of different characters, 
I've always found that it is easiest for me to not write things down because to start writing things down, even in the form of notes or suggestions to myself, begins to solidify or harden those ideas. But in fact, for me, now this is just speaking for me, not other writers, I don't know other people's technique, but for me, I must, I don't do, it, especially when I'm world building, I don't do intuitively so much as I do, I try multiple different possibilities in my head, right? I'm playing a kind of three dimensional, well actually more than that, but kind of fourth or fifth dimensional chess, and you're trying different possibilities, and for me, as long as I keep them fluid, yes, I'm saying my brain is fluid. Um, that's not a very good recommendation, I know. But as long as I keep these ideas fluid in my head, it's much easier for me to mix and match different possibilities and say, okay, so if this character goes here now, then that kind of stimulates that particular theme and gives me a moment to do that with a character. Oh, that sounds good. And then I stop and go, okay, but how will this affect this story? And how will it affect when that character and this character are supposed to hook up with each other later on? And how will it affect the general timeline of X, Y, or Z? And then you say, okay, that was a crap idea. And you throw it out and you start doing that again. And, <coughs> excuse me. So I probably um, spend three times as much time actually thinking each day about what I'm going to write than I do actually writing it. And when I sit down and write, it's actually a very brief, maybe an hour and a half, because I know a lot of what I want to do. I'm not sitting there staring at a blank screen. I'm thinking, okay, and now I have to have this happen. And I'm, I remember I had a little bit of dialogue that felt good, and I'll pop that in now. So, but it's still mostly in my head. The second part of the answer is, then I got to the new books, which are, as some of you may know, a return to the Ostinard world of Dragon Road Chair, et cetera, et cetera. So I sat down to start thinking about how I was going to do that and how I was going to add on to the world and which characters I would revisit and things like that. And suddenly realized, I haven't read that damn book for 30 years. <laughs> right? Because if any of you who are writers know this, uh, published writers, because this is the, 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 the key part, is that by the time you get a book out into publication, during the last year or so, you probably went through it word by word four or five times. So, yeah, you know. So that the last thing you ever want to do for the rest of your life is go back to that book again. Because first of all, you know what happens. There's not, not a lot of drama. But also because you, you simply, you know, you're, you're, the, the live book is the one that's the next one. And it's like if you ever play tennis ball with a dog. Um, at which I have done many times in my life. That also goes on my resume. Liquid brain, plays a lot of tennis ball. Um, if you, 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 know, you throw the ball, the dog fetches it, right? If you throw the ball into the bushes, especially juniper, juniper is hell. If you throw the ball into the bushes, and then go, oh shoot, I'm not gonna go into the juniper bush to get it, I'll go find another tennis ball. You come back and the dog is staring at the juniper bush. The dog is not, in my case anyway, my dogs, very single-minded, they're not interested in the ball in your hand. They are interested in the ball that was alive, which is the one in the juniper bush. And basically, for a writer, at least again, for me, that's true of the book you're working on now. That's the live thing. The books you've written, however fond of them you are, are essentially inert. You know, they're no longer living things, they are artifacts. And you're very happy other people are reading them and are bringing them back to life, as I mentioned, but they are not alive for you. So, here I was writing in this incredibly complicated world that some idiot had invented with a huge amount of backstory and history and all this other stuff. And I was cursing that idiot, I want to tell you, as I'm going. I literally did. I was going, who writes this complicated crap? Who can keep up with all these characters? <laughs> but I have two friends, one of whom is in the room right now, Ron. You can wave your hand. There's Ron. And another friend, Ilma, who lives in Kassel, Germany, who know the books far better than I do. They know the books the way that, say, I used to know Tolkien, where I can tell you, you know, yes, those were the blue wizards and they did this, and oh yeah, the only other uh, Nazgul that had a name was Kamul, the Easterner, you know, that's him and the Witch King of Angmar, you know, all this trivia stuff that I knew because I was young and my brain was less liquid, um, or at least less squishy. 
So thank God, you know, 